All right, well, we will go ahead and get started here today. Uh, thank you all for joining us. I would like to introduce Cameron Casimir. Cameron has a bachelor's degree in exercise science from Bowling Green State University, as well as his master's degree in exercise physiology from the University of Akron. Cameron has been an exercise physiologist in cardiac rehab here at Altman for seven years. Cameron enjoys creating relationships with the patients while watching them improve every day following their cardiac procedure. Today's health talk is called Exercise Medicine for Your Heart. Cameron? All right. Well, thanks for the introduction there. Uh, as you can tell, uh, the title of this class is called Exercise Medicine uh, for Your Heart. And who am I? I am an exercise physiologist in cardiac rehab. I've been in Altman since 2014. And like uh, that was stated there, I, I have a bachelor's degree from Bowling Green and then a master's degree from University of Akron. I'm originally from Dover, Ohio. And then what I'm looking to do here for this health talk is to provide a, a short background on what heart disease is and really important part of it is what are some possible signs and symptoms people may have uh, when they may be, heart, may be having a heart attack or possible underlying heart disease. Uh, benefits of exercise is something I'm gonna go over a lot in this class as well. Uh, how exercise can act as a medicine in reducing cardiac risk factors. And then also ways to decrease the risk of heart disease. Then to close it out, I'm gonna talk about just some, which is my true background, exercise some exercise recommendations for anybody that may be looking to get into exercise. So why this topic? Uh, of course, not only just because I, I work in cardiac rehab and I, I do this day to day, but I think a surprising stat for a lot of people that the leading cause of death in men and women in the United States is from coronary artery disease. Uh, and every year about 735 uh, 1,000 Americans have a heart attack. And I thought these stats were very interesting here. From the American Heart Association, 70% of those heart attacks are first occurrence. And in 2020, half of the deaths in men were from a heart attack. So 50% of the men who died, um, heart attack was the main cause. And about 47% of heart attacks happen outside of the hospital, suggesting that people may not act on early symptoms of heart disease. Half the time I think is because they may not know the signs and symptoms. So I think that's why it's very important uh, part of this class. Uh, heaven forbid for yourself, but if you're ever with somebody, I think it's also important to know the signs and symptoms and what to do if you're with somebody that may be having these type of uh, symptoms. So background on coronary artery disease. Uh, what is the definition of it? So it's damage or disease in the coronary arteries, and it's a buildup of plaque causing a lack of blood flow to the cardiac muscles. So why is that important? Um, our actual cardiac muscle, just like every other muscle in our body, it needs oxygen to work efficiently. So how does it get oxygen? It gets it from the blood flow. And if there's some type of obstruction that's causing, that doesn't allow that blood flow to travel to where it's trying to get, uh, that is actually the definition of a heart attack. Okay, a heart attack is when part of the heart muscle actually dies due to a deficit of oxygen. So it goes a certain amount of time with no oxygen. Uh, so, you know, the, the famous thing to do back in elementary school was uh, tie a rubber band around your finger. And, you know, who could do it the longest? And what happens when you did that? You know, you'd, hold, you'd tie that rubber band on there real tight and you, you go on for minutes. And what happens is your the tip of that finger starts to turn really dark red, and then maybe purple and maybe a dark gray. And if you held on there a long time, it would turn black. What happens when that tip of that muscle actually turned black? It actually died. And that's pretty much where heart attack was. You cut off all the blood flow to where it was trying to get to, and that muscle didn't get any oxygen for an extended period of time, uh, and it actually died. So that we wanna avoid that at all costs, of course. So there was a saying down there, I have the very bottom of this slide, time equals muscle. So that's a huge statement. 
meaning somebody who may be having a heart attack, uh, the longer they go with having that heart attack, uh, the more damage can be done, which the more damage, the worse the outcome. So I'm gonna talk more here as we go into this here about uh, how important it is to get in and what happens when you do get into the hospital if somebody is having a heart attack. Uh, kind of the same thing if you, you've heard along strokes, uh, time is brain when somebody has, is having a stroke. The, the longer they're having a stroke, the more brain damage they may be having. Same thing for the heart attack. The longer they go with the heart attack, the more damage. Um, so with that being said, uh, what causes that initial, uh, or what, what, how does the actual buildup of, of whatever it is in your artery, whether it be plaque, calcium buildup, how does it actually start? So that's what I'm gonna go through here. I kind of skipped around on that first slide, but I uh, have the process of CAD. How does it start? Uh, so it begins with endothelial dysfunction. So the inner lining of your arteries, you have these little teeny tiny cells that when we're born, they're all lubricated, uh, blood flows through those arteries uh, without any issues at all. Um, so another thing that those endothelial cells do, the inner line of our artery, uh, they also produce a thing called nitrous oxide, and it's a natural dilator of the arteries. So it keeps your arteries nice and wide open, creates a nice open lane uh, for that blood to flow through. So very important to have us have great endothelial cell uh, function. So it starts with endothelial cell dysfunction, and I have injury written there. So injury meaning if I would sit here and if I would if I would cut my arm, okay, let's call that an injury, and I start bleeding. What has to happen for that arm to stop bleeding? Your body is always going to try and heal itself. So what my body does is right in my forearm, it's gonna send a signal to my brain saying, hey brain, you have an injury to your right forearm. You need to get that fixed. And at that point, your brain's gonna be like, all right, I'll get it fixed here. Let me send down some of these uh, blood platelets. And I think of these blood platelets as little ambulances. They turn their sirens on, they, they go to that injury. And what does these, these blood platelets do is they try to heal or clot that open wound that's there, that cut from my that cut that I have in my arm. So it clots that area, it scabs, the scab falls off, your skin's good to go, no more cut. Okay, same thing happens to the artery. There's an injury to the inner lining of your artery, and the same thing happens. The brain gets a signal saying, Hey brain, you have an injury to your LAD, inner line of your mid-LAD. Same thing happens. Blood platelets get drawn there, those little ambulances. Uh, they try to fix or heal that injury in the LAD. And as that's doing that, uh, there's the platelet aggregation there. And then as that's trying to heal that area, that's a lot tougher to heal, those endothelial cells compared to my arm. So as they're trying to fix those, it takes a long time. And as that's happening, you have uh, LDL floating around in your bloodstream. And that is your cholesterol, specifically your bad cholesterol. And what makes those LDLs bad? We're gonna actually talk about those later, but they're very fatty and they're very sticky. And what they do is they begin to stick to where those platelets are trying to heal that injury. And at that point, those lipids will start to build up. And then a little process called lipid oxidation happens. And uh, fancy way to describe oxidation or like in real life is you think of metal when metal oxidizes it turns into rust when these uh, lipids when they oxidize they turn to that nasty p word and that is plaque so that's kind of the whole process of of how plaque actually starts so it all starts with that initial injury so what what caused the initial injury what 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 actually is behind causing injury to my endothelial cells. Like my arm, that was me cutting it. Well, what causes injury inside the arteries are your cardiac risk factors. And I have them listed here. Hypertension, aka high blood pressure, stress, high cholesterol, smoking, diabetes, age, sex, male, uh, obesity, high fat diet, physical inactivity, 
in heredity. And, and of course, some of these are modifiable risk factors, meaning we can change them and improve them. And others, uh, you know, age, sex, heredity, uh, we cannot change. So those are non-modifiable risk factors. So we're gonna go through some of the modifiable risk factors today. That's gonna to be the main point of this class. And we're gonna talk about how we can control those and specifically how exercise can help control those. And maybe actually the most important part of this class, like I said, heaven forbid for yourself, uh, but if you're ever with somebody that might be having some of these signs and symptoms of heart disease, uh, I'm gonna kind of go through what to do and, uh, and it could really help somebody out. Cause you just never, I always, when I teach this here uh, in our cardiac rehab, I, I talk signs and symptoms a lot. Uh, I always talk about how it can happen anywhere. It can happen in the movie theater, it can happen at family Thanksgiving, it can happen at a sporting event. Um, so let's go through some of these signs and symptoms. So I, I wrote the first couple on purpose cause probably the most common. And the first one is chest pain, somebody having chest pain. Um, and there are a few ways people can describe chest pain. Um, you can describe maybe as a squeezing, a tightness, uh, maybe a burning, uh, or just a pain in general. Uh, so there's a few different ways you can describe chest pain. And I read that about 75% of heart attacks, chest pain is the primary symptom. So does that mean everybody gets it? No, there's still that one out of four that may not get it. And sometimes, believe it or not, I, I think movies misportray heart attacks sometimes. You know, what do you see in movies sometimes? People are grabbing their chests, falling over. I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but I, I've seen so many people here at Cardiac Rehab that are like, yeah, I, I'm just, just having this uncomfortable feeling in my chest. Uh, and I just, I knew something wasn't right, but it wasn't like a, you know, knocked them over chest pain. Now I have had people that have had that, uh, but I would say the majority of people who've had chest pain, it's something that's, it's just a, it's a bother. They just know something's not right and they feel that there is a pain there, uh, but it's not something that's gonna knock them off their feet. Um, shortness of breath. And this isn't necessarily saying um, becoming short or becoming breathless with exercise. Uh, this is saying, you know, somebody uh, goes to, you know, get their mail at the end of their driveway and they get back to their, uh, their house and they just cannot catch their breath. So like, this is just a sudden onset of, man, I, I don't know what it is, but I just cannot catch my breath. Uh, that could be concerning. Um, pain down the arm or the arms. Notice I put an extra S on there. Uh, I know a lot of times people say, oh, it's pain down the left arm. Uh, but it actually could be pain down the right arm or pain down both arms. We had a guy one time that had pain down both of his arms that stem from his chest. And he says, huh, this, this can't be my heart because I've always read that it's pain down the left arm. So this can't be my heart. Whereas he was actually having a heart attack. So it could be down both arms or it could be down just the right arm. Uh, fatigue. Once again, kind of going along with the shortness of breath not necessarily being tired after uh, a long day of work or a really good workout. This is fatigue, meaning somebody, uh, you know, maybe put the, emptied the dishwasher. And after they did that, they were just suddenly wiped out, you know, for no reason. So that could be uh, also concerning. Uh, a sudden onset of sweating uh, along with some of those things. I don't know why my screen just went off there. Um, sweating, nausea, vomiting, dizziness, fainting. All those are, are also signs of some heart disease. So let's say if you're, you're with a buddy, you're with some friend and you know they, you look over at them and, and you, can just, you just tell something's not right with them. So, so I have a little scenario. So you look over and they don't look right. They maybe look a little pale and you notice they're kind of rubbing their chest a little bit. And you say, hey, uh, Bob, what's what's going on over there? You, you don't look very good. And I see you rubbing your chest and Bob's like, yeah, yeah. Uh, my, my chest is, is all of a sudden hurting like a nine out of 10. My my arms feel heavy. My my fingertips are are tingling and, and I just start sweating a lot. And, and I just, I, 
I kind of, I feel like my, my breath is not come to, coming to me. So in that moment, uh, what should you do? Okay, maybe A, you can maybe put some ice in their chest. Maybe that'll cool them down a little bit. Uh, B, go over to the neighbor's house, have, have them check, check Bob out a little bit. Maybe they can figure out what's going on. C, you should tell Bob, yeah, you should probably drive yourself to the hospital. You don't look very good. Or D, calling 911. So of course the answer is D. The first couple sound a little silly, but in all seriousness, uh, the reason I put those first three are because those are all answers I've heard people do uh, when they were having some chest pain. So D, 911 is of course the best answer. Few big takeaways from calling 911. Hopefully they can get there pretty quick. Uh, they, can, they can hook Bob up to an EKG. They can take his blood pressure. And based off the EKG right there, they can, they can tell if Bob's having a heart attack at that moment. Uh, they can give him a nitro, nitroglycerin, they'll put under his tongue. And what that does, if he does happen to have blockage there, it, it'll open up his arteries just enough to maybe save some of that muscle. We talked earlier about that time is muscle. It can save just enough of that muscle before they get to the hospital. Uh, and probably most importantly is that on the way to the hospital, they can call over there and say, hey, we have a 55-year-old male. He's currently having a heart attack. Um, we need a heart cath lab ready. So as soon as they get Bob into the hospital, they can have him right there in the heart cath lab. And the, the goal is from, from 911 call to stent, let's say if he didn't need a stent placement, they like that to be within an hour, which is pretty amazing uh, to, to try and get all that done within an hour. And that goes back to that saying, once again, time equals muscle. The faster Bob gets in there, the faster he gets intervention done, the better the outcome. So very important there. So here's a quote. So if exercise, I, I read this in a book, uh, if exercise came in pill form uh, and all the, the benefits that exercise has in it, if all that came in pill form, it would be the most prescribed medication in the world. I thought that was a pretty cool uh, quote. So all the benefits in, of exercise that came into a pill would be the most prescribed medication in the world. Which leads me to benefits of exercise. So I'm gonna go through all eight of these here as part of the class, uh, but these are the eight that I'm gonna be going into. And there's, and are there only eight benefits of um, exercise? No. So I didn't wanna keep you guys here all day. So I kept it to eight. And there is actually a reason why I chose these specific eight. And I'm gonna tell you that at the end, why I chose that, these specific eight. So number one, uh, strengthens the heart. So exercise helps strengthen, strengthens the heart and decreases heart rate. So aerobic exercise, AKA cardio is one of the best ways to improve cardiac muscle strength. So if you're an exerciser at home, how do you know if, you're, if your cardiac muscle, your, your heart is strong or not? Well, if you ever check your heart rate, if somebody has a, a good, a nice low resting heart rate, usually around 60, uh, probably means they have a nice strong heart and you're an exerciser, probably means you have a nice strong heart. Your heart's able to pump out a lot of blood with each pump. So therefore it doesn't have to be as often. And a way we can tell if your heart's getting stronger throughout an exercise program, specifically here in cardiac rehab, uh, somebody will start you know, their first week or so, their heart rate, will go up pretty easily. And then as they get stronger and stronger and stronger week to week, what we'll tend to see is the heart rate will slowly get lower and lower and lower. And then also their recovery time from their workouts, as far as the heart rate goes, will recover faster and faster and faster. And what that tells us is that heart is able to uh, meet the demands of the body Okay, with less beats, with less beats per minute uh, heart rate. So oh, it's stronger meaning it's able to pump out more blood with each pump. So therefore it doesn't have to pump as often. So we see that straight up with the heart rate, which is really, really a neat thing to see. Um, another way you can tell about if somebody's heart is getting stronger, there's a measurement called your ejection fraction. Maybe some of you guys that are listening have had your ejection fraction checked before. Now they measure it in a percentage, 
usually through an echocardiogram is, is probably the most common way people get their ejection fraction uh, checked. If you ever had a heart cath, you can get a number based off that as well. But uh, uh, the echocardiogram is probably the most consistent um, way people get it checked. And what it's measuring is it's your, your left ventricle in the bottom left part of your heart. It pumps and then it refills, pumps, refills. When it refills uh, with blood, it fills about 100 milliliters of blood uh, every time. So a strong, healthy heart should be able to pump out 55 of the 100 milliliters of blood. So if you count that as a percentage, that's 55%. So that is a strong, healthy heart. Ejection fraction of 55%. You say 55 to 70. So we've seen some people in cardiac rehab that have had such bad heart attacks that has caused so much damage to their heart. Going back to the time as muscle, they went a long time with the heart attack that their ejection fraction dropped to 10 to 15 percent, which is very low. Uh, we actually have a couple of people on the program right now with with that low of ejection fractions, uh, which is a whole other story for a different day, but. Uh, we have seen some people increase their ejection fraction, uh, bringing it back up from 10 to 15, maybe up into the 20s, maybe low 30s, uh, which is possible from the exercise. The exercise helps strengthen the heart. Um, so we'll go to number two here. And this is probably one of the biggest ones here, blood pressure. Exercise helps decrease blood pressure. And I'm probably gonna spend the most time on this one because uh, blood pressure uh, is the primary risk factor for heart disease and stroke. So what is the true definition of blood pressure? You probably get checked all the time in the doctor's office. You probably check at home with your home cuff uh, and you get these numbers. What, what are those numbers actually saying? So what is blood pressure? What is the definition? What is it telling us? So it is the force of blood flow against your artery walls during the contraction and the relaxation phase of the heart. So you got your systolic and your diastolic uh, levels. So let's say you get, you get your blood pressure checked and your blood pressure comes out 118 over 76. That top number, that 118 is called your systolic pressure. It's measuring how hard is the heart working during the contraction phase of the heart. So pretty good. Uh, and I have that chart there, what we're aiming for. Uh, and then the bottom number, the 70 number, uh, that is looking at what is the uh, can, what is the force of the heart during the relaxation phase of the heart. So you got your systolic over the diastolic. So we got 120 over 80 or less is what we're aiming for. Uh, Pre-hypertension is 130 over 80 or higher. And then you got your hypertension, which is considered high blood pressure, and that is 140 over 90. Um, or above. Now, let's say if you go to the doctors and, and you hit a big traffic jam and you know you're not going to be on time and, you, and you're going to the doctor's office and, and, uh, and you step in dog poop and you get in there and you're late and you're all flustered and you go to the doctor's office and, and he checks your blood pressure right away and you're so flustered and, and it's 190 over 92 and doctor's like, oh my gosh, you're pretty high. And then you tell the whole story of what happened. And, and then the doctor is going to be like, oh, well, let me let you sit for a few minutes. Get your thoughts together. I'll wipe that, that dog poop off your shoe. Let, let's get you calmed down. We'll recheck that blood pressure. We're not going to take that blood pressure. So why is he not taking that blood pressure? He knows that is not a true resting blood pressure. So to be, to be um, diagnosed with uh, the high blood pressure, that is, that is considered 140 over 90. Um, 140 over 90 um, at rest. So very important difference between the two. So decreasing blood pressure. So I have an example here of a cardiac rehab patient, okay, who's just starting exercise. So let's see what happens with their exercise here. So because exercise has a short-term and a long-term uh, effect on exercise. So uh, how is exercise going to help blood pressure? So here we go. So patient A, he comes in pre-exercise. We take his blood pressure. 
And this could be in general for, for anybody that starts their exercise routine. That is just starting. So they get their blood pressure beforehand, 158 over 86. And that's at rest. You say, okay, it's a little elevated, something we can work on. Uh, during exercise, if you happen to get your blood pressure checked during exercise, it goes up. And that's actually a good thing. We want it to go up with exercise. Uh, we get it and it's 184 over 80. That actually, I'm not gonna be too concerned about that. We have a cutoff here uh, of, as far as what's too high for exercise. And it's considered over 220 for the top number and over 110 for, for the bottom number. And that's what the research shows for 30 minutes of exercise, or really just exercise uh, in general. Sorry, the phone. Uh, exercise in general is keeping it below that number. Um, so let's say uh, they, they do their exercise, they, they do a nice cool down and they do some stretching, some nice relaxation and breathing. And let's say we get another blood pressure and it's 122.74, much lower than when they started. So, and the person looks at me and they go, what, 122.74, I came in at 158. How is it that much lower? Well, what happened was when they were exercising, their arteries get nice and dilated or they get wider, they get more flexible. However, it goes up with exercise because your heart's working harder. However, when we're all done with exercise, nice and cool down, uh, the arteries remain uh, nice and wide. We call it vasodilation of the arteries. And uh, they remain nice and wide, uh, nice and flexible. However, the heart's not working as hard anymore. So uh, it's a great advantage for us to take uh, for blood pressure uh, to lower it. So let's say this gentleman goes home five hours later and he's so excited about his new blood pressure that it's one it's down in the 120s. He hasn't been in the 120s since he's been 30 years old. And he, he has his home blood pressure cuff and he's like, oh, I gotta show my wife what my new blood pressure is. And, and he, he checks it and it's 154.84 and he says, He's like, what the heck? He says it was just 122 a couple hours ago after cardiac rehab, after I exercised. Uh, what's going on? I don't think Cameron knows what he's doing. I don't think he checks check my blood pressure, right? When, however, what happened was, you know, you know, he told me, he says, I thought exercise cured high blood pressure. I thought my, my one exercise routine would cure it. However, what happened was, this is the short-term effect. Uh, when he went home, his Five hours later, his arteries slowly went back to its resting state, and then uh, his pressure went back up. So fast forward, uh, like I said, unfortunately, one exercise workout does not cure high blood pressure, unfortunately. I wish it did. I did not create that rule. Uh, but however, there is good news. Continuing a regular exercise routine for at least 12 weeks and beyond may significantly have our blood pressures. Let's go back to that gentleman here, pre-exercise. This is 12 weeks later. He's, he's doing really well. He's lost some weight. He's exercising 120 over 70 is his new blood pressure. He's feeling really good. During exercise, we had a modest increase. Very good, 156 over 80. And the goal is we do actually want that top number to come up about 20, maybe 30 points with exercise or more. Uh, so that's perfect. We'll be happy with that. Uh, very end, he cools down. We get another blood pressure on him. Very nice and relaxed. He has that vasodilation in effect, 106.68. Very good. Uh, five hours later, he has to go home, show his wife. He says, "This is. I, I'm pretty sure my blood pressure is really good now. He checks it again, 118 over 68. Very happy with it. Um, so, uh, so what happened from exercise routine number one? and 12 weeks later. Well, like I mentioned earlier, exercise has an acute, aka short-term and chronic long-term effect on blood pressure. So, so what happened at the end of patient A's first exercise routine? Uh, I mentioned earlier the, the arteries, uh, the vasodilation, then five hours later that vasodilation wore off, the arteries went back to its resting state and then went back up. And then the, the 12 weeks later, you know, his, his new resting state is nice and wide, nice and relaxed. Therefore, he has a new uh, uh, healthy blood pressure.
<clears throat> Let me get a quick drink here. Number three, benefits of exercise. So somebody who may be looking to lose weight, exercise is a great way uh, to help lose weight. However, I always like to uh, put a caveat to this. My second bullet point there, I always say uh, exercise is a great way to lose weight, but also in addition to a heart healthy diet. I heard a great quote one time that I, I always talk about, and it says, you cannot out exercise a bad diet. I think that's a great quote because uh, losing weight to begin with is not easy. Ask anybody who's lost weight. Uh, trying to lose weight to begin with is really hard, but trying to lose weight on a bad diet uh, is even tougher. So a combination of diet with exercise is a great way to help uh, lose weight. Uh, so exercise helps decrease body fat and increase muscle mass. So body fat, how can we help decrease that with, with in, in addition to the uh, heart healthy diet? cardio exercise or aerobic exercise. So you're doing a bike, a treadmill, walking, swimming. Uh, those are all good ways to help decrease body fat. Uh, I get this question a lot. They say, Cameron, how many calories do I burn during a workout, like a 30 minute workout? And it's something I never like to answer because I always get a look of disappointment from people uh, because it's never as many calories as we would expect. Um, so I think if you just go ask a, a somebody on the street, like, hey, how many calories do you think you burn in 30 minutes working out? I think the answer would be like, oh, I burned probably like 800 to 1,000 calories. But if you if you watch the machine, and uh, you can maybe, I would say uh, a lower level exerciser can burn maybe 100 calories in 30 minutes, maybe compared to a high level exerciser, maybe... 400 calories, a real high level exerciser. So between 100 to 400 calories, you can burn in 30 minutes. Uh, however, should you base a good or bad workout on how many calories you burn? And the answer is no. So you wanna, main reason for exercise is feeling good, getting your heart a good workout, feeling healthy. Don't worry about the calories uh, because that will come. So also with body composition, it helps you increase your muscle mass. And that's gonna be mostly from uh, weights. So there's all kinds of different weights you can do. You know, those little dumbbells, uh, you know, there's the machines you have at the Y or here, here, that we have here at Altman North, uh, like the novice equipment, you have free weights. Uh, but you get, this, you get this saying a lot here, but I don't wanna look like a bodybuilder. I don't wanna do weights. And I think if somebody's exercise, if you're just a normal exerciser, average exerciser, you're doing some ways to be healthy, I think chances are you're not going to look like a bodybuilder. Uh, those bodybuilders that that are, you know, the Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know, someone like him, I, I think a lot of times people don't realize how much those those guys eat. They eat like six, seven thousand calories a day to look that big. So I think doing average, you know, exercises and uh, and weights two to three sets of 10 to 15 reps uh, are very good and you're not gonna look like a bodybuilder. So if anybody is concerned about that, weights are very good, I think just for uh, general well-being, because unfortunately, as we age, what happens to muscle mass? Muscle mass will tend to decrease. So um, I think, I think uh, weights are very good to help slow that process down and can actually add muscle mass. So, kind of off note here, but I just read a research site not too long ago that people over 90, there's been a study done that you can still add muscle mass. So if somebody is listening to this and they're over 90 and they, and they want to lift some weights, you can still add some muscle mass. So that's very good. Great news. Uh, number four, uh, exercise helps improve cholesterol. So what is cholesterol? So of course, uh, cholesterol is a cardiac risk factor. And it's a fatty substance that travels around in our bloodstream. And kind of a fun fact about cholesterol, uh, a lot of people might not know is our own liver produces enough cholesterol for us to be healthy. So how do we end up getting high cholesterol? 
a few different ways. Uh, a diet too high in fatty foods or animal products and a diet too high in added sugars, which could be a whole nother hour long class about added sugars. Uh, very bad. Uh, the more research has come out about added sugars, uh, the more uh, detrimental it is for our health. You know, they're finding added sugars is a culprit for just as bad as saturated fat for heart disease, uh, cancers, arthritis. So, so trying to limit added sugars is very important and it does increase cholesterol. So trying to be careful with the added sugars, the fatty foods. And then there's also a way that can be hereditary, uh, high cholesterol. And that is our parents passed down a liver that might be producing too much cholesterol and that causes high cholesterol. So those are ways we can have high cholesterol. So exercise can actually help that, uh, which I'm gonna get to here in a second. So if somebody's had their cholesterol checked before, um, you usually get a piece of paper back or nowadays uh, they post it on your, your my chart probably. Uh, but what are you looking for? It's called your lipid profile. And it has a few things listed there. It shows total cholesterol, LDL, HDL, triglycerides. So what are we aiming for? Total cholesterol, we're aiming less than 200. Uh, and a lot of times cardiologists, people will say uh, uh, individuals with heart disease, we're aiming for less than 180. And then there's some doctors out there who say, you know what, I don't care about total cholesterol. I want to know what is your LDL versus your HDL and what are your triglycerides? So LDL, we're aiming for less than 100. Uh, if somebody happen to, happens to have heart disease, aiming less than 80. Uh, and like I mentioned earlier, uh, the LDL is the fatty substance that deposits onto the inner lining of your coronary arteries. So these are the bad guys. And then we have the good guys, the HDLs. Uh, we're aiming for above 40 to 50. Uh, and specifically, it's men are aiming more than 40, women aiming more than 50. Uh, and what HDLs are, I think of those as little taxi drivers. And what they do is they, they drive around your bloodstream. And, and the reason I call them a taxi driver is they, they act like they pick up the LDLs or they sweep them. They pick up the LDLs and what they do is the LDLs end up returning back to the liver. At that point, the liver is like, oh, LDL, I dealt with you once. You're no good for me. I'm going to get rid of you. So the liver acts like a trash can, sends it to the GI tract. And with the help of fiber, fiber helps get rid of your LDL through your waste. So, which is another way we can help with cholesterol is increasing our fiber intake, which is a whole nother class. So, and then we have triglycerides. These are your desserts, okay? Your high sugar, high fat foods are gonna increase triglycerides. We're aiming less than 150. Uh, and um, a bad combination, or, or I should say unhealthy combination of these lipids here is having a high LDL, low LDL, or HDL, and a high triglyceride. That is an unhealthy cholesterol. What we're aiming for, of course, is, is a low LDL. We want a higher HDL above those numbers, and we definitely want lower triglycerides. So that is an ideal cholesterol. So how does exercise improve cholesterol? So remember I talked about those HDLs, the good cholesterol. And I remember I, a way I remember, I remember them is LDL meaning the lousy ones, the HDLs meaning the healthy ones. So, that's, so if you have trouble remembering those, that's kind of a little way, a tip you can use to, uh, to remember those two. Uh, so exercise helps increase the production of the HDLs, those little taxi drivers. So if you have more taxi drivers drive around in the bloodstream, the less LDLs there would be to deposit on your arteries. So if you picture New York City, uh, downtown New York, and you have all these people you know, along the street, and they all have their thumb up in the air trying to get a uh, taxi cab, okay? If the people are LDL cholesterols, the bad, bad cholesterol, and the taxi drivers are the HDLs, what happens if I don't, if I have very little HDLs uh, or very little taxi drivers drive working at the busiest time um, in New York City? You're gonna have a bunch of people lining the streets trying to catch a taxi cab. Let's say if I increase my uh, production of taxi cabs and I have a bunch of them driving, uh, picking up these people on the side of the road, 
I'm going to have less people on the side of the road. That's kind of what the HDLs do for you. They, they take away more of those LDLs, more of those people with the thumbs up in the air, uh, therefore decreasing the LDLs. So that's very good. Uh, here's a fun stat that I like that I added on here. So one 30 minute cardio workout. So doing exercise for 30 minutes uh, can decrease your total cholesterol by five points because of the uh, increase of the HDLs. However, the catch is for that, anything good, there's got to be a catch. Those points can come right back with 24 hours of physical inactivity. So that's where you got to be careful with that. So trying to maintain exercise a couple of times a week. Uh, this is also very important. Big cardiac risk factors, smoking. I have a couple of studies here. I'm not going to go through too much of it, but kind of the, the summary of these here is talking about how exercise uh, decreases the urge of smoking and people who have already quit, it helps with withdrawal symptoms of going back to smoking. So, so it decreases the urge to use tobacco. Uh, six is huge. I think this is a big one. Stress. Stress is a big cardiac risk factor. Um, we've seen plenty of people in cardiac rehab. They're like, man, Cameron, I've, I've exercised all my life. I've eaten pretty healthy. What did I do wrong? Uh, and if it wasn't smoking or if it wasn't hereditary, it could be a high stress. Uh, so what happens during stress? So during stress, our heart rate and our blood pressure uh, both go up, they both increase. Somebody had a good question one day. They said, well, Cameron, how come, you know, when we're exercising, when blood pressure and the heart rate go up, uh, that's supposedly good for us. Why can't I just be stressed 30 minutes a day, five times a week, and that count as my exercise? Isn't it doing the same thing? And uh, that's very logical thinking, but there's a big difference between the two. So I'll kind of go over that. So when you're exercising, you got legs pumping, sometimes legs and arms pumping, depending on the machine you're doing. A lot of muscles are contracting. So those muscles, in order for them to keep contracting and working, they need oxygen. So that's where the heart comes into, comes into play. The heart has to do a couple of things during exercise. It has to beat a little faster to get more blood flow down to those working muscles. And it has to beat a little harder to try to get that blood flow there a lot faster. And that is the heart rate and the blood pressure. So during exercise, uh, blood pressure and heart rate go up for a purpose. Whereas during stress, are we usually moving around as much as we are consistently like we are when we're exercising? I would say probably not. Just to kind of give an example, let's say you know something that stresses a lot of people out, at least me, is traffic. You know, you're sitting in traffic and uh, you're there for, um, I don't know, stuck for an hour and you just have not moved and you're just, you can just kind of feel it that your, um, your blood pressure, heart rate are going up. So when that's happening, um, all that excess, you know, pressure that's being built up around the heart, it's not being dispersed out to the body like it is during exercise. So it puts a very unnecessary workload on the heart. Um, so trying to, you know, help with those stress levels or maybe taking some deep breaths while in that traffic. Well, once you get out of that traffic, maybe if you exercise, exercise helps release some of that dopamine, which makes us feel good and relieve some of that stress. So there are a lot of studies that have shown people who have a regular exercise routine uh, show lower stress levels than people who do not have regular exercise routines. So I think it's very important uh, to exercise to help with stress levels. Uh, for diabetics, people who uh, have diabetes, exercise is a great way to help improve blood sugar and stabilize it at a healthy level. So when we exercise, what happens is, is our muscles actually need glucose in addition to oxygen to keep working efficiently. So where it gets the glucose is it pulls it from the bloodstream uh, and therefore lowers your, somebody's blood glucose or blood sugar level. Um, so that's pretty much what diabetes is, is, a, is too high of a level of blood, sugar, uh, blood glucose uh, in the blood. So it's kind of the same thing as the um, <clears throat> blood pressure. Does one exercise routine cure diabetes? 
Unfortunately, no, but continuing a regular exercise habit may significantly lower normal blood sugar levels. And number eight, kind of bringing this full circle here, decreases the risk of heart disease. So exercise has the ability to act as a medicine in improving cardiac risk factors. Uh, so the reason I picked all of these uh, um, topics about uh, you know, blood pressure, cholesterol, stress, diabetes, smoking, all the things I just went over, and I kind of showed how exercise can help with those things. Well, exercise acted as a medicine because most of those things I went over, uh, there is a medication out there that helps control those things. Hypertent I'll go through it here. Hypertension and heart rate. Uh, there's beta blockers, metoprolol, and there's, of course, there is uh, lisinopril, amlodipine. Those are all blood pressure medications. Somebody who's looking to lose weight, there's some weight loss pills out there, fat burning pills. So exercise can help with that. Cholesterol, you get the two big ones, Lipitor and Crestor. So exercise helps lower cholesterol. Tobacco cessation, they have the nicotine patches, the gum, Chantix, uh, those type, those nicotine replacement therapies. Uh, stress, they make the anxiety medications. And of course, diabetes, they have the insulin and metformin. So this is kind of showing that exercise can act as a medicine and do some of the same things medicine can do. Uh, and then all these things that I picked that I went through these past seven uh, points uh, are all cardiac risk factors. So this is kind of showing how exercise can act as a medicine and helping control cardiac risk factors. So I hope that makes sense. Um, so what, so if you are looking to get in doing some exercise, what are some recommendations I may have? So frequency, I'm going to say four to six days a week for some exercise. Uh, and you can, if you wanted to get fancy, you could do a target heart rate. Uh, but I think a good thing to try and do is using a, a rating of perceived exertion uh, of four to six on a 10 point scale. I'm going to show you that here in a second. How long should you exercise for? I think 30 to 60 minutes. I would say no more than 60. There's, there's studies that show there's no additional benefit from exercise after 60 minutes. And then uh, there's different types of machines we can do. Treadmills, bike, elliptical. And if you don't have any machines with weather being nice and now, nicer now, uh, walking or swimming uh, also count as aerobic exercise. Uh, here's a fancy, if you wanted to figure out what you wanted your target heart rate to be, but uh, I would say if you don't have any history of heart disease, uh, I wouldn't worry about this right now. This is, I think this is a great way to determine if you're working at a, a good enough uh, level. Uh, I think working between a four and a six on this number chart is a good intensity to, to work out at, especially if you wanna go for a walk and you don't know how fast to walk. If you're walking and you're like, huh, if I had to rate this between one and a 10 right now, I'd say this is a five. This is a somewhat difficult walk. I'm walking at a good pace. And I got my breathing up. I think that's a very good, uh, exercise level. Now, if you're walking and you're like, oh, this is really easy. This is like a two. I'm barely moving. And you wanted to, and the purpose of that walk was to exercise. I would say you can walk a little faster, or maybe go somewhere that has some hills uh, to, to push it a little bit. And then on the other end, if you're walking, like you can't catch your breath. And this is like a, a nine. It was like an eight. Uh, I'm just really hot, sweating. Uh, this is too much. Maybe you're going a little too hard. So between a four and a six, I think is a very good level to exercise at. Uh, if you are looking into getting some strength training, two to three days a week, uh, here's some reps, two to three sets of 10 to 15 reps, I think is good. And doing it at a moderate weight, not going too heavy. And I don't like to put a time period on it. So I put a little side note for everybody if they're gonna do some weights at home. And that is to avoid the Valsalva maneuver. And that is, I'll give you the scientific definition first, and then I'll give you the easy definition. So it goes, expending energy without releasing carbon dioxide. So what that means is holding your breath during a workout. So if you're ever doing some weights at home, try not to hold your breath, okay? That's the thing you do not wanna do because uh, it causes you to pass out. So try not to hold your breath and, and do nice breathing uh, techniques while you're lifting. And then different types of things you can do for strength training, free weights, you can do those uh, therapy bands, medicine balls, novice equipment. 
I like those little dumbbells you can buy at the store are the best. Usually a dollar a pound, anywhere from three to 10 pounds, I think is good to do. Uh, a lot of reps. Uh, so if you're looking to do some strength training, I think those are a very good place to start. Then stretching, I think stretching is very good. I put frequency seven days a week. I think stretching is really important. So how hard should you stretch? You wanna to stretch to where you feel the stretch, but not too far to the point where it either causes you pain or you lose form on your stretch. So you wanna to go to a point where you feel a good stretch, but not too far to where it causes pain or loses your form. And about 30 seconds per stretch is very good. And there's two different types of stretching. There's static and there's dynamic. Static stretching is, is bend and hold, count to so many seconds. Dynamic stretching is movement stretching. So if you watch sports nowadays and they're doing like high knees and butt kicks and leg swings and, and those type of things, those are all dynamic stretches. So as far as when you should stretch, it's the best to do these static stretches, the bend and hold, count to 30 seconds after your workout. So I know you, many of you may do these before your workout, uh, but it, believe it or not, doing these static stretches, you know, bend over, touching, the, touching your toes, that type of thing, that's actually can be worse for your workout and actually uh, increases your risk of injury, believe it or not. So what is recommended is doing dynamic or movement stretching before your workout and then static stretching afterwards. So if you need some recommendations for dynamic, maybe just a slow walk, or if you're doing a machine, you know, for exercise, starting slow on the machine, that's better than stretching, honestly. So just, just some tips. And then so back to the quote from the beginning. So if exercise came in pill form, you know, the, the benefits of all the exercise that it has in your mind, your body, your health, it would be the most prescribed medication in the world. I thought that was a great quote. So clarification to close out here. So do not stop taking your prescribed medications following this health talk. Uh, so by participating in regular exercise routine, uh, doesn't mean do not stop taking your medicine. We're just, I'm just saying exercise may act as a medicine and hopefully it may lead to a decrease in medication, which we see all the time here in cardiac rehab. Uh, so, and, I'll, and uh, I think it's very important to, to continue. If you are an exerciser, continue it. If you do not exercise, think about starting some type of routine, uh, as simple as walking. It's very good for you. Uh, and it can maybe help lead to less medication in the future, which who doesn't want to take less medicine?